Hello and welcome to this online event hosted by the Liu Institute for Asia and Asian Studies at the University of Notre Dame. My name is Michelle Hawkes and I am the director of the Institute. This semester we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the generous gift from the Liu family that enabled us to establish our Institute and that helped to transform Notre Dame's teaching and research in Asian studies. Throughout this semester, we proudly present to you the research done by Notre Dame Asianists who joined our community within the last few years. For the first lecture in the series, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Professor Alexander Xu. Alex serves as the academic advisor for the Liu Institute for Asia and Asian Studies as well as for the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion, which is our co-sponsor for this event. Professor Xu is also an adjunct assistant professor for the Keough School of Global Affairs. He is an historian of early Buddhist scripture in China and earned his doctorate in religious studies from the University of Chicago, where he previously earned a Master of Divinity and a Bachelor of Religious Studies and Biological Science. His latest publication is a forthcoming article in History of Religions entitled Making Canon Practicable, Scaling the Tripitaka with a Medieval Chinese Buddhist Anthology. In addition to working on early Buddhism, Alex also works on contemporary global Buddhism, which will be the topic of his lecture today. And the lecture is called Coming to Terms with Engaged Buddhism in Asia. Alex will speak for about 30 minutes, followed by a discussion. You can submit your questions for Alex at any point in time during the talk by hitting the Q&A button and typing them in the window that pops up. And now it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Professor Alexander Xu. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Michelle. A big thank you to the Liu Institute and the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion. Um, I wanted to start my talk uh, by describing how I began studying engaged Buddhism. Uh, the first event that happened uh, was that a colleague of mine, Ang Leig, is authoring an encyclopedia article on engaged Buddhism. And she shared her initial draft with me um, over social media. And I wrote a long email reply based on my sort of um, wrestling with the topic and thinking, um, thinking about my own critiques of the article where she might go further with it. Um, and she liked my email so much that she suggested that I print it up, I publish it as a research note. And so what I'll be presenting today is based off of that research note. Um, the second avenue that I started thinking about engaged Buddhism through is through my work with the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion. Um, my work with Tom Tweed and Maha Mirsa and other partners at Ansari, like our board members, faculty fellows and other friends, um, have, we've all had these discussions centering around the concept of what the um, idea of engagement has been in the past, uh, what it is currently, and what it might be. Um, and I've also had interest in thinking about whether or not engaged Buddhism might form a kind of interesting analog or partner for integral human development, uh, which is a core component of our DNA here at the Kyo School of Global Affairs. I want to offer the caveat that uh, this is tentative COVID-19 flavored research that was done mostly online um, and not with human subjects, but I have been able to ask some of my Buddhologist colleagues and friends um, as I'm revising this piece and thinking about this topic more deeply and something that I invite um, you as well to help me, help me think about. Um, as Michelle mentioned, I'm a medievalist and I primarily read texts. That's where my training lies. My specialty is in 6th and 7th Ch uh, century Chinese Buddhist scriptural anthologies. Um, but to this project, I bring my own academic interests in questions of citation, how texts are cited or invoked or reproduced, um, on canon formation, right? Um, how do certain texts or saints become authoritative, um, and critical thinking about which categories things can be filed under and what kind of work that categorization um, allows for. Let me get 
start my slideshow here. So my main object in this topic, uh, in this talk today, um, will be to work on pluralizing engaged Buddhism. That is to say, questioning the self-same stability of the object engaged Buddhism. Um, this is a popular move in Buddhist studies overall. Um, this move from looking at Buddhism as a presumed self-same object to something like Buddhism's, that is to say, its plurality around the world, uh, the different forms that it's taken historically across different linguistic and cultural backgrounds. Um, I'll be pluralizing engaged Buddhism along three different axes. Um, the when, the where, and the how. So first, I will try to periodize engaged Buddhism. Uh, that is, break it into different periods where we see it being used, um, leading to the contemporary moment where my question for my colleague Ann Gleig was, does engaged Buddhism still exist? What does it look like? Um, if it does exist, how, how do we engage it? Um, I'll move later in my talk to uh, the topic of provincializing engaged Buddhism. That is to ask, what does it look like outside of the Anglophone world? And what does it look like, especially in the Anglophone world uh, where engaged Buddhism is a popular discourse? And I'll conclude by politicizing engaged Buddhism. That is to look at how um, activists are using the term, how scholars are using the term, and how those two spheres actually overlap or are interdependent in some important ways. Um, so these are primarily academic questions, but I think they're important questions for practitioners um, of Buddhism um, and people in the policy world as well. They translate in interesting ways by asking if it still exists or how did it exist in the past? Uh, we can think about, can we engage it and how can we engage it? Um, by thinking about its provincial nature we can ask what languages should we engage engaged Buddhism through? Um, and by politicizing it, seeing what sort of political work it does in the world or how it constructs a sort of non-political sphere for it to operate, we can think about on um, whose terms and where can we meet it and see it in the world to, do, to partner with it potentially. So I'll begin with a definition. And uh, this is from Sally B. King, one of the foremost proponents of engaged Buddhism and popularizing it. Um, she defines engaged Buddhism as a contemporary form of Buddhism that engages actively yet nonviolently with the social, economic, political, and ecological problems of society. At its, at its best, um, this Engagement is not separate from Buddhist spirituality, but is very much an expression of it. Um, and I've paired this definition with two images that we might think engaged Buddhism through. Uh, the first is monk immolating himself uh, to protest the Vietnam War, um, which from a um, Christian perspective is not nonviolent, it's violence against the self, uh, but there are other ways to read that action as um, fundamentally nonviolent. Um, and the other is of the Dalai Lama meeting with Pope John Paul. Um, two different modes that we see springing from Buddhist spirituality to act upon the world. Um, a third picture here is of some Chinese Buddhists affiliated with uh, the Compassionate Relief Organization donating uh, protect, protective um, equipment um, in the fight against COVID for hospitals um, to use. Um, now we can see with this definition that we see a kind of mirror to Catholic social activism or even Catholic social teaching and it's uh, determined this worldliness. And um, another thing that we could connect engaged Buddhism to integral human development um, is it sort of refusal of a secular truce that we might characterize as um, taking place after the war of religions um, on the European continent, uh, wherein religions took a less active role in the political sphere to be experienced privately among individuals. Um, a sort of refusal of the idea that religion in politics should be divorced 
religion primarily taking place in the private sphere and politics um, in the public sphere. Buddhism 101. Um, so these, this is a map of Asia. Arguably, um, you could create a map of Asia based on all the different places where Buddhism has been influential. Um, the Buddha was around in the 6th or 5th century BCE, um, and various expressions of his teaching sprung up first in the Indian subcontinent, but today um, these are the places where you can still find Buddhism expressing itself. Um, these three turnings of the wheel are typically thought of as historically sequential and building off of one another. So Theravada Buddhism um, is the emic term that Theravada Buddhists call themselves in Southeast Asian countries springing from Ceylon or Sri Lanka and becoming popular in Southeast Asia today. Um, it means uh, that which is spoken by the elders and it is typically stereotyped as a conservative or otherworldly, uh, more monastic form of Buddhism. Um, Mahayana is the, is the first, is the second turning of the wheel, right, that follows um, a change of ideal from the Arhat ideal, which is that monastics should strive to get out of this world um, and achieve nirvana in one way or another, um, to a different kind of more world-facing ideal, uh, the bodhisattva ideal, right? The idea is that both lay and monastic Buddhists, by practicing Buddhism, can act as bodhisattvas now, which is to say, um, acting compassionately, saving other sentient beings. Um, Mahayana means the big or greater vehicle and contrasts earlier forms of Buddhism as Hinayana, a lesser vehicle, uh, which is a polemical uh, distinction. Vajrayana um, is the thunderbolt vehicle or the diamond vehicle, and we see its expressions as starting from Tibet and spreading to other regions of the world um, like Mongolia. Um, stereotypes that are associated with it is that it is focused on secrecy, and power and lineage and is more ritualistic, um, which you know have their own forces in how they're perceived by the West and how they perceive themselves. Um, by showing this map, I want to emphasize um, that Buddhism has always been profoundly shaping society along political, economic, cultural, and ethical lines um, all throughout its history and look at the map now um, has effects on the nation state system and has various national expressions today under modernity. So if we turn to the question of asking what is ethical Buddhist spirituality, um, we have to arrive at and discuss some of the contents of Buddhist doctrine and how engaged Buddhists draw from traditions. Um, I will um, reiterate that Buddhist expressions and been just, um, just to what is called of existence here, right? Basing uh, um, a doctrinal worldview on seeing everything as being constituted by suffering, non-self and impermanence. Uh, that these can take various expressions and, and look very, very differently uh, from place to place. But this is how um, Sally King and others um, have tied traditional Buddhist ideas to um, what they call engaged Buddhism today. Right, so you might know from Buddhism 101 or your own reading around um, that many Buddhists see their tradition as being sparked by the discovery by the Buddha of the Four Noble Truths, the first of which is that all is suffering and that everything is suffering. One well, response to this in Buddhist praxis, in taking various vows or precepts, um, is taking a vow not to harm others, not to kill others. Right? So first, do no harm, don't, don't kill, 
in some expressions of Buddhism, don't eat meat. Um, in Mahayana Buddhism especially, but other forms of Buddhism as well, um, the idea that one responds to suffering with compassion is paramount. And we can see here a parallel to integral human development. Um, where Buddhism diverges from integral human development um, is its insistence on the idea of non-self, right? This idea that what we are as persons are actually just trails of phenomena, trails of causes and conditions, um, karmic streams that come together that only give rise to the illusion that we are individuals or that there is anything constant between who I was five minutes ago and who I am now, right? A lot of Buddhist action, um, a lot of Buddhist pra practice um, is realizing non-self, realizing that one um, is not who one feels oneself to be. Um, in some forms of Buddhism, especially modern forms of Buddhism, especially engaged Buddhism, um, there's an accent on um, interdependence. This idea that one is formed through one's experiences with others. One is formed through the other. One only knows oneself by encountering, engaging with the other, the environment, the world around us, uh, various religious others, various ethical others. Um, and um, there are early expressions of this in classical Buddhism that emphasize interconnectedness of all phenomena, um, but there are also classical versions that express this interconnectedness of all phenomena as primarily negative in character, right? This is what they call samsara, what uh, the Buddhists who are trying to achieve nirvana are trying to work their way out of. Um, I should also note that there is a parallel in engaged Buddhist thinking about interdependence uh, with how various social scientists um, or various Catholic social teachings think about um, structural violence, right? This idea that just by virtue of the way that the world is laid out, um, <clears throat> that marginalized people experience the brunt, um, the violence of society just by being on the bottom. And that is expressed through various health outcomes, experienced through how long people live, um, experienced by how people are marginalized from power and flourishing. Um, and engaged Buddhist ethics of all kinds seem to um, draw on this parallel in interesting ways. One contribution, right, that engaged uh, Buddhism might also differ from um, integral human development might be its emphasis on non-duality. And in its piecework, right, um, there is less of an emphasis on figuring out who is right and who is wrong and trying to pan out a little bit right, to avoid saying that there are these people and those are this people and um, we need to see ourselves as one people. And that is, seems to be a unique contribution um, in peace work, though folks at Croc might be able to uh, direct me to think about this in a more sophisticated way. Um, finally, um, the Buddha taught that all phenomena are impermanent. That is always in flux, always fading away, will not be lasting forever. Really different from um, Christian ideas of God or the soul, right? And this marries, or this is um, compatible with um, various materialist ontologies, um, as well as, um, you know, offers engaged Buddhism the warrant to diverge from what the Buddha taught previously. And there are various moments in Buddhist canons where the Buddha suggests that not all teaching ends with him and that Buddhism might have to change, might have to look different, might not even be Buddhism anymore in order for it to do its work in the world. And so this adapt adaptability, this flexibility, this progressivism um, is something that um, engaged Buddhists like to draw a line from various Buddhist texts, classical Buddhist texts, to practices of um, modern Asian Buddhists um, to the kind of work that engaged Buddhists are doing today. So I'm going to be profiling um, some 
socially engaged Buddhists of Asia that are typically come as a package, um, come as what I like to think of as the avengers of socially engaged Buddhism. Um, so I'll go through about 10 of these figures, talk a little bit about their thought and their lives um, insofar as the field of engaged Buddhism has um, profiled them or made them prominent. Um, the coiner of the term engaged Buddhism um, is a Vietnamese social activist and peace activist and monk uh, named Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, and I'll speak a little bit more about his thought in a bit. Um, I paired him with A.T. Aryaratne of Sri Lanka. Um, <clears throat> I like to think of these two as paired um, as um, peace with Thich Nhat Hanh, who um, was an activist against the Vietnam War, on the one hand, and Aryaratne focusing more on development. So they are um, representing Croc and Kailag, respectively. Um, and uh, Thich Nhat, Nhat Han, um, of course, spoke and collaborated with Martin Luther King in the 60s. Um, so that makes him only two degrees of separation away from, from Father Hesburgh. So there is um, an interdependency with Notre Dame here as well. Um, Thich Nhat, Thich Nhat Han founded the Orchard of Interbeing, if you want to research, do your own independent research. Um, the organization that Arya Ratne is affiliated with is Sarvodaya, which seems to be influenced by Gandhian notions of community development and promoting that across, across Sri Lanka. Here we have uh, Sulak Sivaraksha and Preya Maha Gosananda. Uh, Gosananda was a peace activist in Cambodia um, and famous for uh, the Dhamma Vietra, uh, the peace walk that he took in 1992 around areas of Cambodia that were littered with um, mines that hadn't been set off yet as a way to heal the nation. Um, and these peace walks inspired various environmental movements like ordaining trees in Thailand and across Southeast Asia. Uh, so there's this lineage of, of engaged Buddhist thought that moves from place to place um, in Asia um, in the 90s at least. Uh, Sulak Sivaraksa uh, was a democracy activist and the founder of the International Network of Engaged Buddhists, uh, which seems like an umbrella organization under which all these uh, Avengers can do their work or see each other or meet each other or collaborate. We have the Dalai Lama, known for his work in promoting the self-determination of the Tibetan peoples and a world peace activist overall. Um, and I paired him with the venerable Zheng Yan uh, of Taiwan, the founder of Compassionate Relief, Siji, uh, which is known in Taiwan today uh, for humanitarian aid, wherever there are earthquakes, wherever there's tsunamis, wherever there's poverty, um, they're there first. They're often the people that are responding first. They've been successful in letting the People's Republic um, let them in to do humanitarian work there, uh, where other religious groups um, have not. Um, they are also very prominent and important in um, creating institutions for um, health care and hospice work in Taiwan. Wherever there are hospitals, uh, Tsi is usually there as well. And then we have some um, problematic outliers. Bimra and Bedkar, uh, one of the framers of the Indian Constitution and activists for out outcasts, um, thought that he could fight casteism in India through both secular means and uh, also Buddhism at the end of his life. And he promoted a form of Buddhism wherein the Buddha fought against caste and worked to destroy it. Um, and in order for um, Dalits or outcasts to uh, determine their own lives, um, he suggested they convert to Buddhism as well. Um, so the map it, uh, that I showed earlier that shows that Buddhism is dead in India is not entirely accurate. Of course, that's where a lot of the Tibetan diaspora live, 
Um, and a lot of Dalits have also embraced Buddhism. Uh, but it's a problematic entry, right? Because he was doing his form, or he was promoting his form of Buddhism um, before Thich Nhat Hanh had coined the phrase. Aung San Suu Kyi is also a problematic entry. Uh, before, when she was fighting for democracy in Myanmar, in Burma, um, and speaking from a Buddhist point of view, um, she was embraced under the label of engaged Buddhism. Um, but now, it, now that she has been seen um, not taking strong enough of a stand um, in uh, the Rohingya genocide, um, you know, that, that puts her in an awkward position. Maybe she's not in the canon anymore. Maybe she doesn't belong there. Um, she's a sort of awkward fit in this category, and it points to difficulties with the category itself. Finally, engaged Buddhism has come to the West, and these are two proponents of engaged Buddhism in the US, Joanna Macy and Bernie Glassman, respectively. Joanna Macy, if you want to look her up, has been instrumental in connecting her ideas about deep ecology to Buddhist ideas. Um, and Bernie Glassman has been interested in using his organization, uh, the Zen Peacemakers, to be a witness for homelessness in the US. Um, and of course, it's interesting here that he's drawing on uh, various Jewish uh, conceptions of, of witnessing um, to his activism there. Now we can uh, begin to look at some, at, at this definition that I offered earlier with a little bit more of a critical eye um, and Various academics have brought these critics, critiques to the fore, and I'll rehearse a few of them today. Um, first thing that we should mention, right, is that it is a tautological definition. Where Buddhism is socially engaged, that's where socially engaged Buddhism is. Um, other academics have pointed out, well, Buddhism has always been in a society, has always been engaged in society. Um, even where uh, movements have turned various figures or turn Buddhists away from society, that too happens in a society. Um, to distinguish socially engaged Buddhism from a prior Buddhism um, creates interesting category problems. Um, the biggest problem, right, is that it essentializes Buddhism. It creates a form of Buddhism that needs to be modified with the adjective socially engaged. Right? It assumes that Buddhism from the get-go is non-engaged non or passive or a or antisocial, that is individualistic, um, and that traditional Buddhism by default, to borrow language from Max Weber, is primarily an otherworldly mystical tradition that is made thisworldly and aesthetic. Right? Um, another sort of issue that people have had or that you know, I was thinking by myself when I started this project was, well, what other religious traditions could we add socially engaged to? And does that show that there's issues with the, with the, um, the concept to begin with, right? Does it make sense to talk about something called socially engaged Islam or socially engaged Christianity? And I would argue no, because our assumption is that these traditions see themselves as, or there's the idea that these traditions are, are, are already political or are already socially engaged. They don't need to be modified. Um, and so for scholars, uh, this definition might be too secular of a definition in presuming that there are already two domains, that of the political and social world and that of the religious world. Um, and for activists, for socially engaged Buddhists that go by that name, this is a problem as well, because it suggests that there's a kind of Western teleology that Westerners or Thich Nhat Hanh and others have to recover what Buddhism was about all along, um, and, or that they're offering new crucial supplement to the category of Buddhism, um, and that this throws traditionalists under the bus by saying, you know, socially engaged Buddhism is real Buddhism. Does that make other forms of Buddhism less real or less authentic? Um, it's, it's a problem 
that engaged Buddhists have had to deal with. And as I suggest, um, is might go to some of the way of explaining why um, it's harder to see these days in some way. So I want to periodize engaged Buddhism. And that means I want to return to the moment of its coining. And here I'm drawing from a work by Elise DeVito showing how uh, developments in modern Chinese Buddhism seem to have influenced uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's idea of engaged Buddhism as he's coining it in the 1960s. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh seems to be putting together the content for engaged Buddhism, what he wants it to be doctrinally, um, at the level of practice, maybe as early as the 1950s, right? So he's already publish, um, publishing in Vietnamese what he thinks Vietnamese Buddhism should look like. Um, he has the story that he tells as well about um, the peace activist that set himself on fire, probably being really into what he was promoting at that time before it was named Engaged Buddhism. Thich Nhat Hanh's Engaged Buddhism, when he coins it, um, has a post-colonial flavor to it, right? Um, it was being activated against French colonial powers and American colonial powers and communist powers um, contending for Vietnam at, at, at the time. And it was profoundly pacifist in its nature. So when he coins Le Bouddhisme Engagé, he's drawing from both Chinese modernist discourses, renewing or finding this idea of this worldly Buddhism, which is still around today, um, which probably starts in the late 19th century and becomes big in the early 20th century and is a dominant form of Buddhism in Taiwan today. Um, the word engage is probably borrowed from discussions of Sartre and Camus in post-colonial Vietnam, in colonial Vietnam. Um, so when Sartre promotes this idea of literature engage, uh, this idea that an author needs to be political, can't be like Proust and ignoring the world, needs to be of the world, needs to be political, needs to account for the ways in which they are already political in the world. Um, this is the perfect adjective for Thich Nhat Hanh when he wants to communicate to the West. But there are other Asian ideas floating as well in his coining of engaged Buddhism as an idea, including Gandhi's um, also anti-colonial movements, uh, nonviolent resistance under the banner of Satyagraha, and how that's uh, revised and built upon by Martin Luther King in the United States, whom I mentioned before, Thich Nhat Hanh got to meet with. Um, and another important post-colonial context we should be thinking about at this moment is to what degree engaged Buddhism is being framed as parallel to the non-aligned movement, right? Various post-colonial nations saying, we're not playing the Cold War game. We're staying out of this. We want peace. We want to develop our own nations on our own terms. I think there is a second movement, a second moment in engaged Buddhism um, in the 1990s, where we see all of these academic volumes, edited volumes being put together, promoting that which has happened previously. Um, under the um, aegis of uh, the Avengers, as I mentioned, in Asia, as well as some of the work that was happening um, at, at the same time in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, we have three edited volumes here. Um, the first one edited by Sally, e, Sally B. King in 1996, um, and a follow-up volume, Action Dharma, that you see here with Arya Rutne on the cover. Um, and if you want to dig into the social ethics of engaged Buddhism um, and how that plays out and how that might play out for various projects in Kyo, um, I encourage that you look at Sally King's magisterial Being Benevolence from 2005, where she flushes these ideas out and puts the Avengers together and in dialogue with each other. Um, and Socially Engaged Buddhism is the explainer volume that I pulled the definition from that we're, I'm using in, in this talk. Um, this is the moment of um, canon, canonization, um, where I think all these Buddhists, engaged Buddhists, are brought together and fit under the label. And it's actually an open question of whether these engaged Buddhists encountered each other and talked to each other as engaged Buddhists, right? They, they all embrace, or some of them embrace the label 
um, in different ways, um, but push it in different directions. With here, um, we see a kind of continuity and break, right? These are mostly uh, white American and European authors um, writing about Asian Buddhism. So there's a kind of, um, and writing about various Western convert forms of Buddhism that, that fall under the label. Um, so you can see this work as kind of potentially turning the wheel again, right, to a new form of Buddhism that um, Westerners get to set the terms of and define and bring together. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about why, why some, some folks have found that problematic in a bit. Um, so, right, I began this talk, I began this project by asking where, where is engaged Buddhism now, right? Scholars seem to have shied away from the term and or the phenomenon. Um, they no longer talk about engaged Buddhism in the way that they used to in the late 90s and the early 2000s. And I'm sort of curious about both that scholarly phenomenon, is that because they're just less interested in it now? Or is it because it's something that's not happening as much either in Western Buddhism or in Asian Buddhism? Um, yeah, so who is calling themselves an engaged Buddhist now? And uh, what are they up to? And um, I've been in conversations with, with Ang Lee and others about where they see the life of engaged Buddhism today and how that's being defined or renegotiated. Um, so as I mentioned, a lot of this is COVID research. Um, so I did a lot of web sleuthing. Um, this is the web page of the International Network of Engaged Buddhists found by Sivaraksa, who embraces the term and has defined it in books and talks of his own. Um, but the website's kind of janky, right? It's not defunct, but it's kind of intermittent in terms of its activity. There are broken links to various national level groups, um, many of which don't even use the term engaged Buddhism to describe themselves. But there is still some activity, right? So there, there was a meeting in 2019, right? And we have some of the Avengers listed here along with people that might potentially lead the next, next generation. The Buddhist Peace Fellowship is linked from the International Network of Engaged Buddhists and often what people point to to say engaged Buddhism is alive today. Um, but even here, you'll notice, right, that Buddhism is being paired with social justice. These things complement each other but need to be brought together. Um, you can see that as well that um, the, the focus of the activism has changed as well, um, turning from peace to maybe racial justice work right? Social justice work. Um, interesting language from the website itself. Uh, for people that, that find this website, do I belong here? Sometimes it can feel lonely when you are a Buddhist activists, activist. Your activist friends say, we don't have time to be so woo-woo when they suggest everyone sit together silently for five minutes at the start of each meeting to ground and center. Your Buddhist friends suggest, let's sit down our cushions and develop more kindness and wisdom. When you try to talk about global climate change and problems of mass incarceration or corporate greed, um, right? These are two unlike entities that need to be brought together. Um, this might suggest that engaged Buddhism is less, less popular than um, the academic community um, might be led, led to believe or might want to believe among ourselves. So provincializing engaged Buddhism, um, right? So first I've suggested that there's a kind of Anglophone scholar activist curatorship over the term itself, that it's been NGO-fied to some extent in South and Southeast Asia, those places where English is still widely spoken among the elite. And when they want to do work with international bodies, right, they'll call it engaged Buddhism in order to talk with other people, in order to build networks, in order to build ideas, um, but I want to move in this part of the talk to talk about how engaged Buddhism is largely unrecognized in much of South, much of East Asia. It goes under different names. There are things that we might want to call engaged Buddhism, um, but sometimes only calls itself engaged Buddhism in East Asia when they're dealing in um, English language contexts. And I also want to point to how even in the UK and the US and Australia, 
uh, when people point to engaged Buddhism, um, a lot of it is coded as white Buddhism, educated Buddhism, upper class Buddhism, liberal Buddhism, Buddhism um, of a particular generation that might be moving on or turning a corner. So on the last point, right, um, various scholars and bloggers um, are showing some discomfort, uncomfortability with the term, right? So Damien Keown, um, scholar of Buddhism, um, describes engaged Buddhism as an anachronistic construction, that what we mean when we say engaged Buddhism is that it's liberal Buddhism. Maybe this is both the case for Thich Nhat Hanh and for Joanna Macy. Um, some scholars have pointed out that it seems to be a white formation and black Buddhists are challenging what those parameters might look like by doing black Buddhism, promoting black Buddhism, in the US at least. Um, and I found this interesting quote in a dissertation about Australian Buddhism recently. Uh, this is from a blog that's defunct now. There certainly has been a lot of talk lately about socially engaged Buddhism and whether or not it is crap, real, necessary, or unavoidable. Right, various ways of making the category disappear. I'm just questioning it overall, perhaps because it's associated with a particular um, age, class, politics. Um, in Asia, engaged Buddhism disappears when you go into the world of non-Anglophone, into non-Anglophone worlds, right? These are the terms that I start with that Thich Nhat Hanh is using um, in his Vietnamese works that become translated as engaged Buddhism when he comes to France and the West and the US. Um, terms that might not be engaged Buddhism in Vietnamese. Uh, crucial here, right, is that he's building off of the idea of Ren Jin Fu Jiao, which Chinese Buddhists or Chinese speaking Buddhists um, have been keen to label humanistic Buddhism. And there's a debate in Western scholarship whether we can just call that a species of engaged Buddhism or if it's something else. Um, something that's interesting when I was doing my COVID-19 internet research is that when you go to the web page, the Wikipedia page for engaged Buddhism, and you click on the Chinese li uh, link and you translate it, it doesn't take you to Renjin Fu Jiao. It takes you to Zuo Yi Fu Jiao, which is left-wing Buddhism. Right? So Chinese practitioners, maybe even of Renjin Fu Jiao, see this as a kind of left-wing thing. When you click on the Korean web link or the Japanese web link, it takes you to So Chonjo Pulgyo, practical Buddhism in Korean, which may be a thing in Korean Buddhism. Um, a lot of Buddhists are engaged in the world, but when they take the label engaged Buddhism, this is how they see it. Um, in Japan, academics have been trying to find Engejudo Buddhism and Shakai Sankaku Bukyo, which are translations of socially engaged Buddhism. Um, but this does not seem to be catching on in Japan. Um, maybe along, maybe in certain organizations, but only in moments when it's facing the West, perhaps, or in reference to the West. Um, and various scholars of contemporary Japan have suggested that there is a kind of secular shyness um, in Japan that um, creates a kind of hesitancy to embrace religion in the public sphere, um, sometimes because it's associated with um, proselytization on the one hand, um, and sometimes because it's associated with uh, dangerous cults on the other. So scholars have found various ways to maneuver. They've adapted the term and have um, gone in different directions. Right? Victor Temprano wrote a review essay of, in, of engaged Buddhism and suggests that at heart, it's, it's often really orientalist because it frames um, Buddhism as um, something that Asian Buddhists aren't doing right, but socially engaged Buddhists can help um, condescendingly um, set them on the right path. Um, Rong Dalai and Jessica Main have also taken up Temprano's challenge and suggest that engaged Buddhism might be an important uh, category for historians to think about other formations that don't necessarily look progressive, um, like early 20th century Renjin Fu Jiao, uh, humanistic Buddhism 
seems to be very nationalistic. Um, Burmese promotion of uh, Rohingya genocide um, is reactionary, but might be a, you know, a species of engaged Buddhism, as Paul Fuller will argue um, in another handbook of uh, engaged Buddhism in 2021. So maybe we need to broaden the category to include non-progressive forms, is what these authors suggest. Um, John Nelson, in his ethnography of priestly innovation in Japanese temple Buddhism, has suggested, let's abandon the term. He wants to look at these um, temple monks, these priests who are very active in um, dealing with social problems like hikikumori, um, you know, um, social anomi, suicide in Japan being a huge problem in the 90s and continuing to today as Buddhism inspired activism rather than socially engaged Buddhism um, because there are problems with the definition for him overall. So let's, let's, let's invert it. Let's talk about the activism that Buddhist actors are engaged with rather than assuming that there are some species of socially engaged Buddhism that's distinct from mainstream Buddhism. Justin T. McDaniel wrote a study recently um, about what he calls socially disengaged Buddhism. That is what Buddhists and families are doing when they go to these theme parks um, across Southeast Asia and East Asia. Um, but Amolele, um, who is a philosopher, um, a traditional Buddhologist, um, wants to capture the term engaged Buddhism as descriptive of what mainstream traditional Indian Buddhism you know, might be overall, that what the Buddha taught, right? Um, or what, how monks interpreted, or how monastic communities interpreted what he taught, um, is to stay away from issues of politics um, and work for nirvana, or work for improving karma, um, avoid politics, avoid society, right? This, this is what he argues is main, mainstream among Buddhism overall. And then Glyag herself, um, in her recent study of American Buddhism called American Dharma, looking at Gen X and millennial American Buddhism, um, suggests, um, you know, sees how engaged Buddhism is a term that people use often, but that other descriptors like postmodern, postcolonial, postsecular Buddhism might be more useful and actually shed a bit, bunch of light on why people might be um, doing interesting things with or turning away from engaged Buddhism as a category and forming new ways of doing Buddhist activism or even of Buddhism altogether. Um, I want to conclude by describing how we should politicize engaged Buddhism, right? Um, both as academics and as practitioners and maybe as Buddhists as well. So there are, first I pointed to the idea that there are other terms and movements that are circulating in Asia uh, that we might like to straightforwardly translate as engaged Buddhism, but we should resist that. We should look at what terms people are using on the ground and when they pick up the term engaged Buddhism um, and how they are doing the translation work when they are doing the translation work. And if they're not, uh, we should try to honor that as best we can um, as anthropologists, social, sociologists, social scientists, historians. Um, I want to suggest that this research um, points to the idea that engaged Buddhists might be a privileged minority and that that privilege um, might manifest itself in the idea that engaged Buddhists are setting up the discourse or set the terms of the discourse to begin with. And so that their claims to represent the whole of Buddhism or real Buddhism, they should be analyzed as such, right? We should pull them down to the realm of the historical and see you know, what they're doing with this term and, and be a little bit suspicious. Claims that, um, of en engaged Buddhists to have transcended politics can be analyzed as political, right? We, we should try to figure out what are you doing? Are you doing a third way thing like Thich Nhat Hanh? Um, are you trying to figure out a way to say you're not Democrat, you're not Republican, you're not anarchist? Um, and is that your form of politics? Is an anti-politics a form of your politics when you're doing engaged Buddhism? Um, these are questions that we can ask here in the West as well as in Asia. I want to suggest that we uh, return a little bit to Sartre and not uh, Nyat Han. Nyat Han popularized, popularized later an idea that all Buddhism is engaged Buddhism, um, probably coming under critique about, are you throwing traditional Buddhists under the bus? Um, 
and using non-dualism, using his sort of Zen uh, Mahayana non-dualism, um, he wants to suggest that we can't divorce engaged Buddhism from what's going around all the time. And Buddhists everywhere are engaging the world. Um, and so we need to put engaged Buddhism in that broader frame of how is Buddhism engaged with the rest of the world. Um, and that's something that Myon Han and Sartre have encouraged us to do. Sartre Wright um, asks, how are authors of novels and poems also um, not divorced from the world? How so I think we should ask, when scholars write scholars, scholarship, how are they putting their thumb on the scale and acting as activists? What are they putting out there in the world? How are they um, changing the world by studying it and claiming how it looks in particular ways? Um, and that way, I think scholars are also acting as activists. And when activists do the activities of categorizing, citing, um, and drawing on scholarship, they're also being scholars. And I think we need to credit, credit that work um, from the viewpoint of academics. And I, had, I wanna end with this, with this uh, provocative claim that maybe where we see engaged Buddhism show up the most often, returning the Nyahan is something that I might call a strategic Occidentalism, right? That is that they are using the idea and they're imagining engagement as characteristically Western in a religiously prophetic mode towards social justice as inherently progressive, right? And so that when Western Buddhists pick up engaged Buddhism, we have to be careful and think about, right, is this, is this a narcissistic activity? Is this them fetishizing an idea of what Western religious activity in the world looks like? Or is it something new or is it something different? Um, we need to be careful to both credit advances um, in thought that they're promoting um, and uh, negotiate that carefully as practitioners when we, when we meet people that say they are, that claim the label engaged Buddhism. Think carefully about what that, what that claiming does and how we, can, how we can work with them better and other Buddhists who don't claim the label, who don't know the label, and who might even react against that label. And uh, that's all I have for you today. Thank you for listening. And uh, I look forward to your questions and continuing this conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alex, for a very comprehensive discussion of a, of a truly fascinating subject. Uh, in, in sort of in line with Buddhist tradition, we, we you know, we are, uh, we don't care too much about time and we, uh, we've gone on a little bit longer than, than expected. But, you know, uh, I want to, I want people to have an opportunity to hear you answer some questions as well. Um, so for the benefit of the audience, we're, we're going to wrap things up around noon, or at, at noon sharp, uh, which gives me seven minutes to engage Alex in, in some discussion. So please keep your answers brief uh, because we do have some interesting questions that came in. Uh, our colleague, George Endler, had a, a factual question related to the map that you showed uh, that you left out Indonesia. Uh, and he mentions the Borobudur Temple in Indonesia, which shows the life of the Buddha, including his social engagement. So could you briefly maybe comment on Buddhism, Buddhism in Indonesia? Right. Uh, the, the map cuts off Indonesia. Buddhism makes it there, creates interesting hybrids uh, with Hinduism. Um, and so various forms of Hindu and Buddhist kingship and society are, are promoted in Indonesia. Um, but that forms the background for engagement with, uh, with Islam his historically. And uh, yeah, it, it is still in the background in Indonesian, um, in Indonesian life. So that, that is a fault of mine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, question that came in from audience member Jack Reynolds. Uh, this is likely a yes or no question, but uh, are you familiar with Radical Dharma by the Reverend Angel Kyodo Williams? I am, and uh, I have not read it yet, but um, thinking about racial justice and Buddhism, it's really hot in social media right now and among my colleagues who are thinking about what they can contribute as Buddhologists to questions about racism here in the US. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm following it 
carefully, and I, I don't know what she says about about engaged Buddhism or whether radical dharma is a form of engaged Buddhism, but it's something that I'm very interested in. Thank you. Uh, and a question from a colleague, Emily Wong, who says, uh, the example of the influence of Sartre reminds me of the third way that anti-fascist and anti-communism Catholics in the 1930s tried to forge. Uh, could you say something about that? And, and perhaps also comment in general on how you might link engaged Buddhism with Catholic social teaching, which is a, another question that has come up uh, as well. I'm not super familiar with uh, colonial Vietnam and what sort of discussions were happening in the Catholic world uh, there at the time. So I'm going to withhold commenting on that right now. But um, I think that is an important strategy that religious peacemakers have used is to say, we're not meeting on anybody's ground. We're creating our own ground on which to stand where we can see each other as people or as non-people, as the case may be for Buddhists, um, and, and try to gain an objective understanding of the situation so we can, we can move forward. Um, and yeah, definitely, I think there, there are resources there for thinking about building peace, but I'm, I'm not the expert here. This is, this is where I can learn from, from the rest of y'all. Okay, the last question, I want to ask this one because I love the way it's been formulated. This was actually sent in prior to your talk, uh, and I think it makes an assumption about what you're going to say, and I'm not sure you've actually said it, but it, the question is, what bothers you the most about how the Western world has embraced Buddhism? Um, the assumption being that there's a misinterpretation going on. Um, yeah, I think, I think what, what bothers me is, um, could be labeled under what other scholars and activists uh, have called cultural appropriation, and I mean, to be fair to a lot of my convert Buddhist friends and, and colleagues, I think people are working really hard on this. I'm thinking about what kind of violence it does to represent a tradition, speak for a tradition as a whole, while remaining ignorant about what that whole looks like overall or in the majority or even the diverse forms that we can take today. Um, that, that I think is something that both scholars and activists and committed Buddhists can, can work on and are working on. And uh, I think that's been really heartening to see. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. Once again, this is normally the point where I ask everybody to burst out in, in a loud applause. Uh, won't be able to do that. Uh, instead, uh, I'd like to thank our audience. And I'd like to remind you of the next lecture in this series uh, on October the 22nd uh, by our wonderful colleague Jennifer Huin, who is in Asian American Studies uh, and will speak to the topic of uh, the Kung Flu, how media images frame Asians in diasporic Chinese and US newspapers during the pandemic. So another very relevant topic by a wonderful recent addition to the Notre Dame Asian Studies faculty. Um, so that's on October 22nd for now. Thank you audience members for joining us. Please learn more about all our future events at asia.nd.edu and please also visit our co-sponsor ansari.nd.edu. We hope to see you again soon and thank you very much. Bye-bye.